opening up the church today uh, because of what the president had said. Uh, and I said, well, first of all, the president cannot order everybody in the country to do what he says. He said only a governor can change the, you know, to make decrees in the state. Um, and I said, and besides, I have another boss, the bishop, who told me that I can't open my church, you know, until at least the 1st of June. And he grumbled and said something about commies and other things, and then continued to rant a little bit more. Uh, and then it came up again later. And then a couple other people asked me what we were planning to do. And I said, well, uh, even though I can feel the reason why people want to do things right now, it's just not the right thing for us to do. We just got to wait until it's time. We have to then fulfill all the conditions uh, that the diocese has uh, given us uh, so that we can make sure as much as we can that our building is uh, you know, safe for people to come into and that we have a plan in place of how to sanitize after people are there uh, until we know for sure that this whole crisis has passed. And in response to the letter that I sent out uh, by email, I heard from several people who said that, uh, you know, they would not be able to come back until there was, you know, real certainty or a vaccine because they would be concerned. Some people have compromised immune systems. Some people like yours truly by virtue of age uh, are in a higher risk category. And even though the building's been basically empty, the church anyway, uh, for two months. Uh, and it's not likely that the virus is uh, anywhere living or active in the, in the church at the moment. Uh, we don't know. And so we're trying to err on the side of caution, a phrase that we probably are sick of hearing, but uh, nevertheless, it's there. And so as I was going through uh, that experience yesterday in my mind and looking over again the scripture for today i began to find some valuable lessons and the valuable lessons one valuable lesson was if you look at the first reading today from the acts of the apostles we see that jesus before he ascends tells his apostles that they need to go back to Jerusalem and wait until they're clothed with power from on high. Now tradition says that the ascension happened 40 days after Easter, after Jesus's resurrection, and that they are told to go and wait in Jerusalem for the rest of the time to pass because then Pentecost, that a week, you know, 10 days later, that Sunday, is the day when the, they were clothed with power from on high. The Holy Spirit came upon them, and we prepare to celebrate that moment next Sunday. But the most important aspect of that is that they were waiting, and they were praying, and they were hoping, and they, you know, were repenting of how they had denied Jesus, and, and how perhaps they had... Uh, acted in all kinds of uh, inappropriate ways. But then as they wait and they pray and they prepare, then they are able finally then to experience the Lord's how empowering of them. So for us, you know, we have been playing this waiting game for a long time, two months. And we have a little more time to go. And, you know, the, uh, the gathering that we were present for yesterday uh, in celebration of uh, graduation and a birthday, um, it was a, uh, it, was, it, it felt strange. And I kept feeling like I was a, a criminal because 
nobody was wearing masks. After we got out of the car, we didn't, and nobody else had a mask, so we took ours off. And we tried to, at least in some instances, guard the social distancing. But it just felt, on the one hand, it felt liberating. On the other hand, it felt like I was breaking the law somehow. Um, and it, it, what it betrayed was a, a kind of sense of we're not willing to wait uh, to do something according to somebody else's plan. And we're not willing to undergo yet more of the suffering that c comes from being obedient. And that's where I think the second lesson today comes in. You know, St. Peter is well aware that by the time that, this, that he's writing this, that many people are go undergoing persecution because they believe in Christ. They've experienced uh, being ostracized from the synagogues. Families have disowned them. Uh, people have taken their jobs away from them. Uh, lots of kinds of things happened that were uh, consequences of their profession of faith in Christ. And I can't help thinking of what the bishop says uh, periodically, that what we're enduring in one sense is a long sacrificial act that we are sacrificing our freedom to, to worship for a greater good, the greater good of, of others in our community, the church, as well as in the community at large, that even though we may think that that's a lot of baloney at this point, and you know, other states have opened up in other countries, yet we're being asked to continue to make this sacrifice for a little while longer, in obedience to our spiritual leader, but more in obedience to the Lord and his call for us to be lovingly listening to what he asks us to do. And we know that Jesus is with us in this. And today we have in the gospel the first part of Jesus's high priestly prayer in chapter 17 of John's gospel, the very last thing that he does before they go out and he gets arrested and the rest of his mission and life uh, are, you know, revealed to us. And so he's praying for his disciples. He's praying for their oneness. He's praying for our oneness because Jesus doesn't stop interceding for us. Jesus is always praying for us and praying to the Father for us. And so we may be still finding this to be odd and difficult. Uh, and sometimes, you know, we might just want to throw all caution to the wind, do whatever we want to do. But if we just keep in mind that perhaps in all of this, we're being disciplined, meaning that we're being taught the importance of, of sacrificial living, um, that we're being taught, again, the responsibility of, of taking care of our neighbor, whether we know that person or not, but that this is all an imitation of the one who poured out his entire life for you, for me, for all people, for all time, that Jesus's obedience to the Father was his glory at the same time. His being lifted up on the cross was his enthronement. And that is then made manifest by his ascension into heaven. And so that's where Jesus continues to reign. But by the Holy Spirit, he's with us, in us, with us, supporting us, strengthening us, praying for us, coming to us sacramentally and spiritually as well through our worship through our prayer for one another, and through all of the acts of, uh, of sacrifice and kindness that we're making. Granted that for some of us, this is a very difficult time 
for some of us, the loss of income, the loss perhaps of a job, but even in the midst of those losses, we can't lose sight of Christ's faithful love and intercession for us and his call to us to continue to wait until we are clothed with more power from on high. And I don't mean that the bishop is, uh, is, is supreme in this or the governor or anybody, but that we be renewed in the Holy Spirit so that when we can uh, operate more freely, that we will continue to respect what we're told, continue to respect each other, continue to respect whatever limits there are for the sake of each other, for the sake of the people around us. And above all, to make it an offering to our Lord who comes to us today through his word and through the sacrament comes to us spiritually at least so that we can continue to live as his faithful disciples. Amen.